Well, uh, you may have heard that on Thursday, August 30th, 2005, New Orleans was flooded with millions of tons of water caused when Hurricane Katrina Carr destroyed levees and other protective devices that were supposed to protect the city from flooding. Eventually, unfortunately, thousands of people were to die. Tens of thousands of homes were destroyed. And the costs probably will run into the hundreds of billions of dollars. In some, New Orleans was destroyed as a city. Now, you may not be aware or you may have forgotten that on Saturday, January 1st, 2000, life went on normally throughout the United States. This non-event was contrary at the time to widespread predictions that computer systems all over America were about to produce false information, that utilities would fail, uh, electricity would be shut off almost everywhere, banks would be unable to track financial data. In short, America would be in chaos. And all of this, why? Because of the Y2K bug, a defect in most large computer bases that allocated only two digits to designate the year in dates, which caused them to read January 1st, 2000, as January 1st, 1900. Prior to 2000, uh, we were told by computer experts that the Y2K bug was too widespread to be fixed in time. And yet, when the time came, it turned out that the bug had been fixed with almost no one and no company suffering any damage whatsoever. The victory was so complete and so quiet that most people have forgotten about the widespread predictions of disaster that preceded it. Prior to 2005, we were told by government experts that New Orleans was safe from flooded flooding because of the upgrading, repairs, and preparation made by government agencies. And yet soon after the hurricane hit New Orleans, the city was submerged in the water that was 20 feet deep in places. Now, how could the experts have been so wrong in both cases? And how could the pending disasters have turned out so very differently from each other? Simple. New Orleans relied on the government to save it from flooding. America relied on the free market to save it from the Y2K bug, which turned out better. Most Americans weren't even aware of the Y2K bug. Almost always, the free market works its magic quietly in the background, uh, without fanfare, without demands, without complaining, without even celebrating its constant progress. The reason the experts were so wrong is that we have all been taught to rely on government for every important need, while the free market is there just to handle functions of lesser importance. One thing we heard often, very often, prior to 2000, was that the government wasn't paying enough attention to the Y2K problem. Only if the government became involved could we expect to have the necessary resources and expertise applied to the problem quickly enough to solve it. But, of course, government is a very institution you don't want to rely on to solve a problem. Government is a political agency. It relies on force for everything it does. It collects all its revenue by force. It prohibits various activities, and it prohibits them by force. It compels people to do things they don't want to do, and it compels them by force. With the power of force at its disposal, it is a magnet for everyone who wants to achieve something he can't do on his own, can't do by persuasion. And the winners, those who get to use that force, are those who have the most political influence. Thus, when money is appropriated supposedly to upgrade the flood protection in New Orleans, the money will wind up in the hands of those who want to use the money for other purposes, all kinds of social programs, whatever. And money gets diverted to uh, functions that it was never intended to be diverted to because the people with the most in influence have gotten their hands on the money. And on and on we could go. We've talked about this on the show so many times about the way that political influence causes money to be diverted to uh, functions that were never intended when a bill was passed. And when a bill is passed, it quickly uh, expands into activities and, and various things that were never intended for it. And programs get larger and larger and larger. And it turns out in the final analysis that everybody gets a share of the pot except those for whom the money was intended. Government is the last agency in the world we should want to rely on for anything important. And it just brings up this question over and over and over again. Why do we rely on government? Why did we rely on government on December 7, 1941, to protect us from foreign attack? Why did we rely on government on 9-11 to protect us from foreign attack? Why did we rely on government to take care of us in any instance, to protect us from discrimination, to protect us from anything? Government is the last agency in the world we should turn to when we need help, because government is the one institution that will never deliver on its promises. I have asked over and over and over and over again on this show, give me an instance where government has lived up to its promises, Give me an example where government has actually done what it said it was going to do. 
give me a reason to think that the next government program is going to do what the politicians tell us it's going to do. Government is an absolute and utter failure. It just simply does not ever come through. And why is it that people keep turning back to it over and over and over again? Well, that's a very important question. And when we come back, I'll suggest some of the reasons that I think that people keep turning back to government over and over and over again, despite government's uninterrupted record of one failure after another. And if you have any ideas, I'd like to hear them. Well, it's not an answer. Uh, the answer is not something that you can give in one sentence, but it really isn't all that complicated. First of all, government has the greatest public relations agency of any institution in the history of the world, and that agency is called the United States Press. Uh, everything that the press does seems to promote big government. Uh, we've talked before about is the government conservative or liberal, is the government democratic or republican, and we cite all these things, corporate America owns the press, and yet the, the journalists uh, say that they voted overwhelmingly for Kerry in the last election and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at the record of the press, the press has supported uh, the Clinton medical program, for instance, but the press has also supported Bush's Iraqi adventures and Afghanistan adventures. Uh, and I come to the conclusion that the press always seems to be on the side of more government. If it's a program that will make government larger, that will bring force in as the solution to our problems, the press will boost it in some way or another. If it's a program that would make people freer, that would take government out of their lives in some way, the press either tends to ignore it or to poo-poo it as being something too fantastic to be even considered. It's off the radar screen if it's for more liberty and less government. And in that way, the press marginalizes any libertarian approach to a solution. The, the solution always has to be a choice between the Republican solution or the Democratic solution, just so long as it's a solution that brings about more government. But why is the press this way? Well, I've thought about this over many, many years, and I've come up with various solutions that seem to fit the situation, such as that the press are generally speaking, people who, who write are generally speaking reformers. And reform has to be instigated at the point of a gun, because if you just let reform uh, stew in its own juices and, and germinate in its own uh, petri dish or whatever, uh, it's going to take too long. And government is something that speeds things up. That's why a lot of people like it is because they want something to happen, and they're too impatient to wait for persuasion to work. They're too impatient to wait until everybody is, or enough people are convinced that this change has to take place, and government is right there with its guns to make it happen right now. So the press, to a certain extent, is biased towards big government because it, it uh, accelerates reform, and journalists by nature are reformers. But even that doesn't say enough. I think we always have to come back to the school system. It is our school system that has promoted the idea that government is a solution. It is our school system that was implemented Starting in the middle of the 19th century and on, our government school system that has put government at the forefront of our lives. In school, we learn that government saved us from the Great Depression. In school, we learn that our government liberated Europe and brought peace to the world in 1945. Whatever it is that government did that was glorious and wonderful, all things bright and beautiful were done by government. And all of those things are going to be promoted in our school system. They're going to be in our textbooks because those are the textbooks that are going to be approved. They're going to be all throughout our learning. I had 12 years of government schooling, and when I came out, I was a budding little socialist because I had learned how government takes care of us and that we must rely on government for our protection. And that, of course, uh, is a, a mantra that uh, permeates journalists just as well as it permeates the rest of us. It permeates all of us. And so all of us come out expecting that we should be able to rely on government. And if we can't rely on government, we can't rely on anybody. If government can't do it, nobody can do it. If government is going to protect us, we're sunk. Therefore, whatever appropriation is required to protect us, it must be made. Whatever laws are required to protect us, they must be passed. Whatever injustice exists in the country, government must do something about it. And so we rely on government. Yes, the free market is there. Yes, I'm glad I can buy a cheap computer. Yes, I like the car I bought last year. Yes, I like going into clothing stores and shopping around. But in the final analysis, for what I really need to protect me, it's government that's going to provide it. And there is just no getting away from it. And how are we going to break this mold? How are we going to break this, this uh, stranglehold that government has on our thinking, that government has influenced us to believe that only government can take care of us? It's a vicious circle. We go to government schools, and the government schools teach us we need government. And so because we need government, we appropriate whatever government wants, including when the government schools fail us, we have to appropriate more money. 
for the government schools. It just goes to reason. We need more money for government schools because they aren't working as they should. And the only answer is more money for government whenever anything isn't working. There we are. And yet everything that we, everything that we cherish, everything that we bless, everything that we, we don't want and everything we hold dear to has been provided to us by the free market. It wasn't government that provided love in our lives. It wasn't government that produced the clothes we wear. It wasn't government that produced that car you bought last year. It wasn't government that brought the price of computers down to a few hundred dollars from hundreds of thousands of dollars. It wasn't government that has made all of these medical advances, medical advances which get tied up in red tape because of government programs. It isn't government that has produced all of these wondrous things that the free market has blessed us with. No, all these things have come to us from greed, from the greed of individuals wanting more for themselves. It is a pejorative word, meaning that it's a put-down word. Uh, it's meant to uh, imply that you are less than moral. In other words, uh, you're greedy, I'm just looking out for my own interest, but you're greedy, uh, in other words. But the fact of the matter is that whatever you want to call it, greed, self-interest, self-seeking, anything you want to call it, that is what protects us. That is what makes us safe in the free market. That's what helps us get what we want. We have low-cost computers because somebody wanted to make a fortune and had to figure out a way to get people to pay uh, for computers in a, in a, instead of buying them from the competitors. And the only way to do that was to produce a better computer at a lower price. And so whatever their motivation, whatever you want to call it, greed, self-interest, whatever, they were compelled to go into the marketplace and figure out a way to make things better. Now, a lot of people had that motivation, but only a few succeeded. And those who succeeded made our lives better. And those who didn't succeed may have failed and may have lost money, but they lost their own money, not the money of other people. And that's the difference between people in the free market and people in government. People in government do not have to earn the money they spend. The money is handed to them. It is appropriated. It is taken by force from other people. It is appropriated, but you might say it is expropriated, taken by force from other people and handed to these people to spend. And once that power is in their hands, anything goes. They can spend it on anything they want. They can further any aim they want. They can reward their political friends. They can punish their political enemies. They can enhance their own power. They can ensure their reelection. They can do anything they want. They don't have to do what the money was appropriated for in the first place. And so tons of money that was appropriated to shore up New Orleans and make sure it was safe from the next hurricane got diverted to all sorts of political purposes that have nothing to do with hurricanes. And as a result of that, New Orleans was unprotected. No matter how many warnings were given by the Department of Engineers, Bureau of Engineers, no matter how much money was appropriated, no matter how many levees were supposedly repaired, no matter what was supposed to have been done, New Orleans was not safe when Hurricane Katrina hit. And that's what we have to recognize, is that when we rely on government, we are relying on people to act against their self-interest, to use money that they haven't earned in beneficial ways for the people rather than in beneficial ways for themselves. And it just is not going to happen. Government is not there for you. Meanwhile, back in the free market, people are scurrying around trying to find ways of pleasing you, not because they like you, not because they give a fig about you, not because they care whether your daughter gets braces on her teeth or your son gets to go to a good college. All they want is to make something for themselves so that they can take care of their own families, to take care of their own needs. But in order to do that, they have to please you, something the politicians don't have to do. One remaining question is, don't the politicians have to please you to get reelected? Answer, no. Absolutely no. The re-election rate is well over 90%. Do you really believe politicians are that efficient in pleasing you? I don't. The politicians don't have to please you because they have the election laws rigged to make sure that they get re-elected. First of all, third parties need not apply. Second, non-incumbents need not apply. The incumbents are loaded up with every conceivable advantage from the campaign finance laws from the free publicity that they get, from the television studios in, in uh, the nation's capital where they can broadcast uh, video news back to their constituents at home, from the free franking privilege that they have whereby they can send out a newsletter every month or so to their constituents without having to pay postage on it, whereas anybody who wants to challenge them, of course, has to pay for whatever he uses. Uh, the whole thing is rigged for the incumbents, and that's why the incumbents have a well over 90% re re-election rate. And the result is, of course, that these people are institutionalized for life. Some people try to get around it by passing term limits, saying that uh, a representative should only be uh, reelected uh, three times. What is, what is it? Maybe six times, so that they serve 12 years altogether. 
and senators can only be elected twice so that they are serving only 12 years also. Uh, but that's not going to pass. The very people that it's meant to constrain are the ones uh, that would have to pass it. It's going to take more than that. It's going to take a revolution. It's going to take a, a revolution of the minds, if not of the guns and the militia. It's going to take people recognizing that this is a complete and utter farce, and it's going to have to create a tidal wave of public opinion that is so great that it overwhelms Congress. And in spite of what the congressmen want to do, they start undoing laws. They start doing the things that we want them to do. Uh, that isn't passing better laws. That isn't turning on us. That isn't uh, any of those things. It means repealing laws and getting government out of our lives because they will recognize that despite all the advantages they've created for themselves, they still cannot prevail unless they do what we want them to do. Well, what do we want them to do? Get out of our lives, obviously. A couple of quick emails uh, that are short and sweet and to the point. Uh, Clint, who's always got something interesting to say out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, says, Isn't it interesting, after several days of inadequate response to the Katrina fiasco, the federal government, meaning King George II, took full responsibility for all the failures. Those that were screaming for someone to take responsibility got what they wanted. But any answer would have been the right answer. By instantly taking blame, King George has soothed the masses by promising a bigger, better government. If the original response had been instantaneous in its actions and some progress had been made, it still would have been inadequate, of course. People would have said, like Engineer Scotty on the Star Trek Enterprise, Captain, I've given her all she's caught, so as to fix the problem. Yes, more, bigger, better government. Positive or negative, it just doesn't matter. Government just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and so thinking inside the box that government has given us allows only one answer, only one way, and that is more government, please. And Jonathan in Washington, D.C. says, I thought you might be interested in the news report published in the Washington Times on September 14th. The headline was, Delay Declares Victory. Delay not meaning uh, holding back, but Tom Delay, the House Majority Leader. Delay declares victory in war on budget fat. In the article, Congressman Delay says about the federal government that after 11 years of Republican majority, we've pared it down pretty good. <laughs> and Jonathan says the government spends roughly twice as much money as it did 11 years ago. Doesn't that speak for itself? God, yes. Two and a half trillion dollars, and they pared it down pretty good. Well, that's what we sent you to Washington for, you dear, dear, dear Republicans. Well, let's talk to somebody who uh, is in the real world, and I trust that's Jay in New York. Good evening, Jay. Oh, well, good, good evening, Harry Brown. Oh, it's, a, it's an honor. Now, you, you mentioned about the uh, government schools and how that uh, effectively brainwashes young people. Well, I was one of those brainwashed uh, young people, too. And uh, it's more than just the curriculum. It's everything from the mandatory attendance, which reminds me a lot of jury duty and the draft. Mm -hmm. it, it also reminds me also the whole government school lunch program. It reminds me of uh, a story my friend in the Ukraine told me about how they used to have these people's kitchens where, you know, they would try, they tried outlawing private kitchens to force everyone to eat together. And uh, it's just all of it. And then, all, of course, the Pledge of Allegiance, which has nothing to do with Christianity or patriotism and everything to do with state worship. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. If, if only it were just the curriculum. <laughs> it's, it's all the subconscious elements of right. school. It's the atmosphere of the whole thing, that, that uh, you're here as part of the, uh, the state, and uh, you're here to obey the rules, and you're, right. here, you're here to be one of the crowd. Right, and then, of course, that phrase, uh, what is it, in loco parentis, you know, in lieu of the parents, I believe it translates to. Right. It's absolutely astonishing. I, I just, why don't more people just realize, I mean, that's insane. How can they, how can they be parents? How can they be role models? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. No, because every parent is different, and every parent has uh, uh, has his own uh, ideas about children, and they can't be translated into a single mold at the school. Uh, that's a very, very good point there, Jay. I'm so glad you called. Um, anything else you want to add before we go? No, that's all. But I, I really appreciate all you do, sir. Okay. We do. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Uh, let's go now to uh, Ohio and talk with Eugene. Good evening, Eugene. Good evening, Eugene. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up? Okay, well, first of all, you were saying the names on government programs where the government delivered what they promised. Well, I'd like to say at least three and maybe one, maybe. Uh, three of them are the Panama Canal, the Manhattan Project, and getting a man on the moon. Now, you could argue we should not have done any of those, but I, we did build the canal. We did make an atomic bomb. We did get people on the moon. Uh, the maybe is the Hoover Dam. I, I don't know exactly what they promised. Well, I can't speak too much about the Panama Canal because I've never really investigated. I have no idea. Uh, what it cost, uh, and no idea what the promises that were made for it, and so on. But I can speak to the Manhattan Project and uh, what was the other one? The Man on the Moon. Oh, the Man on the Moon, yeah. Well, the Man on the Moon, all sorts of promises were made for that. And aside from one spectacular event when men landed on the moon, 
absolutely nothing has happened. All the promises that were made have, have come to naught. All the products that were going to be produced as a result of this, all the scientific discoveries, none of them have occurred. And, of course, the cost has just continued to go on into the tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars. And NASA keeps making promises about this, that, and the other thing, and they can't even find a, 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 a probe that they sent to Mars because they had uh, put the, the uh, measurements in metrics instead of in English. Yeah. And uh, with regard to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> project, right. um, that really was pretty much of a spectacular failure. That started before uh, the Ameri before America got into World War One. I'm <laughs> sorry, before America got into World War Two, and uh, it was supposed to have been finished by 1942 or 43. And of course, it just barely beat the end of the war. And the cost overrun was just fantastic. I can't give you the figures off the top of my head, but the uh, actual cost of the project was many, many times uh, what it was supposed to have been, and it was, as you probably know, riddled with spies. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, it gave Russia uh, a head start on their atomic program. And so in every way, it can be considered a failure other than the fact that something happened. It's like saying, well, government did actually build a road. What more do you want? Right. You, know, you know, without examining the cost, of, you know, and so on. And, of course, as far as I'm concerned, and this is a, a little beside the point, but of course, be, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the whole project was a very, very grave mistake because uh, hundreds of thousands of people died unnecessarily. Here's something else. Uh, we'll talk about New Orleans. Uh, a lot of people are saying, like you, that if the private sector only or did for the levees, it wouldn't have happened. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I think more specifically is that if the private sector was involved, it wouldn't have been the city of New Orleans or the, the levees to begin with. Right. The whole place is under sea level, right next to the sea, and unless somebody was muddy enough to just, just enjoy living underwater, they would not have built the city there. Well, well, here we come to wishes. I wish there were a New Orleans. I love the music. I love the food. I love this. You can't tell me we can't have a New Orleans. I want a New Orleans. And if it's going to take uh, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars and people dying and all sorts of things, then we're going to have a New Orleans because I like to go there every year on vacation. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, as you say, it was a horrible place to have a city. Uh, it went there in the, originally, I presume, simply because it was an advantageous place for a port at the end of the Mississippi River. It, you know, what, what are you going to do, put the port in Austin, Texas? Obviously not. Uh, but the fact is that you, what you would have to do is to establish a port there without trying to have 100,000 homes there as well. Right. And um, uh, the only thing that made those 100,000 homes there was, of course, the fact that the government was, was uh, uh, bailing people out after every flood, and the government was uh, reassuring people that the next flood would not be nearly so catastrophic as the last one, and on and on and on and on. It was the government that kept those people there, and they paid for it with their lives. Right. Well, it's like all those... Uh, cities that are on various floodplains, and the government gives them flood insurance, so they keep rebuilding after every flood. Yes, and it makes no sense whatsoever because there are lots of nice places to live in the United States. Of sea level. Yes. <laughs> Here's one more thing about the education system. It's scary. A friend of mine, I grew up with, uh, you know, known since uh, for 30 some years. He's always free market oriented and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, he's now getting his PhD at a uh, state college here, and uh, I tell people he's been introduced to the dark side of the force. It's in history, <laughs> and uh, I got into an argument about the Federal Reserve. He tells you, oh, the Reserve War is the greatest thing that ever happened to America. And he talks about how bad uh, the working conditions were during the early days of the American uh, Industrial Revolution. It was just good old government that came along and saved those, uh, those workers who had it so bad. Yeah, has he, has he ever referred specifically to what it was the Federal Reserve System did that made this better? Right. Well, what he's saying is that by uh, increasing and contracting uh, the money supply, mm -hmm. it's supposed to prevent uh, you know, all these depressions. But he said, well, in the 20th century, we had all these depressions and recessions. This is counter argument while we had panics in the 18th century. Yeah. 19th century. Nothing as bad as 1929. I tried to explain that to him, but uh, he doesn't want to listen to it. Right. It is funny that on every count that the Federal Reserve System was passed, it has failed. It, right. it was supposed to prevent depressions. It presided over the worst depression in the history of the country. It was supposed to prevent banking panics. It presided over the worst banking panic in the history of the country. It was supposed to establish an elastic currency to end inflation and deflation. And inflation uh, has been far worse in the 20th century than it was in the 19th. In fact, in 1913, when the Fed was founded, uh, the price level was about one-third less than it had been in 1800, but now, today, it is about 15 times what it was in 1913. Yeah. So, on every count, it has failed. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Harry. Thank you for calling, Eugene. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right, uh, let's go now to uh, Dennis in New Hampshire. Dennis, are you with us? Yes, yes, I've been hearing static on the phone, but uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I'm here. That's, just, that's, well? just, that's just my white noise, noise but go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I was going to say it's uh, good having you back. I, I know you've been back for a few weeks now, but uh, uh, it's my first time. I, Saturdays have uh, been tough for me to tune in. I usually don't get in until uh, till when your show's ending. Uh, but, uh, well, tune in to hear me say goodbye. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, uh, I was going to say, with, uh, as far as why people keep, uh, it amazes me, too, why people, it's almost like instinctive that when something uh, goes wrong or whatever else, that their instinct is to say, can't government do something about this or... Uh, uh -huh. or, or uh, what are we going to get government to do? Yeah, it's, it's just it's like instinctive. You know, the thing is, is that I noticed uh, the other thing too that is that 
government or politicians. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, even I noticed they said, you know what they're really, really good at? Excuses. I, I have ne- they have got an excuse. You know, they, I've never seen them uh, ever <laughs> not come up with an excuse. Oh, of course. And it's... Uh, usually it's not enough money. Yeah. Yeah, usually. No. So, like you said, they always... You know, when, uh, when government fails, government fails to get more money and larger. Right. The private industry fails to go out of business. Absolutely. Dennis, if you have anything further to say, so stay tuned through the news. Otherwise, thanks so much for calling. I'm going to put up on uh, the radio links page of my website the article in which Tom DeLay says that they've done pretty good pairing government. I hope you won't mistake it for something I'm <laughs> endorsing. Obviously, I'm not. Uh, Tom DeLay is just blowing the typical politician smoke. Uh, it's a, an interesting game they played between the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, you know, a program is meant to go up by 10% according to the Democrats, and the Republicans only want it to go up by 7%. And then the Democrats just scream bloody murder that the Republicans are just pairing government. They're just uh, going to throw the poor out in the street and so forth and so on. And both sides like to play this game. They both go along with it. The Democrats want you to believe that the Republicans are heartless budget cutters, and the Republicans want you to believe that the Republicans are at least budget cutters, if not heartless. And the reason is because their basic constituency are the people who want smaller government. It's the only group of people that they can turn to who will not run to the Democrats, and so they have to reassure those people that they really are cutting government. So whenever the Democrats say that the Republicans are are cutting government to the bone, uh, Tom DeLay and others will be there to agree with them, even though it is a farce and it is not true. And what is true is that Mike in Washington has been waiting patiently on the telephone. So let's see what he has to say tonight. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, Harry. Thought for looking show. Great listening to it. Thank you. One thing I wanted to um, ask you is that uh, isn't this whole government thing though really a farce? Because uh, politics and liberty are mutually fatal. They cannot. They're not symbiotic. They, they can. They cannot. Uh, they're not co-evolutionary. Over long term, then one must strangle the other. Government exists by destroying liberty. Sure. And therefore, it exists to destroy liberty. Only by destroying liberty can the government fulfill its function, which is to convey its power to its participants. Mm-hmm. Likewise, by only by depriving people of liberty through force or fraud. And the government transfer their wealth to its component persons and their friends. And uh, also, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, in 1997, uh, Queen Elizabeth took over control of the Social Security. Oh, in England? Yeah. She runs our Social Security. Uh, uh, no, you said our Social Security? Yes. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth controls and has amended the U.S. Social Security as follows. S period, I period, 1997, number 1778, the Social Security of the United States of America, parentheses, order 1997, May the 22nd of July, 1997, Coming into force the 1st of September 1997 at the Court of Buckingham Palace on the 22nd day of July. Uh, now, therefore, Her Majesty, as pursuant to Section 179.1A and 2 of the Social Security Administration Act of 1992, and all other powers enabling her in that behalf, is pleased by their advice uh, of of order may be cited as the Social Security of the United States of America. So basically, she took it over, and that's, it says, does this uh, give new meaning to federal judge William Wayne Justice stating that he takes his orders from England? So basically, the Red Coast never left. I mean, they just... They, uh, We've been led to believe that they that they did, but uh, they're really controlling everything, is from what I've gathered. <laughs> well, you know, there has to be a, a, an act of Congress. Is there some act of Congress that did this, that, in your view? Um, well, it's, it's, it's documented. Yeah, there's, you, you can look it up on the Internet. There's, uh, there's plenty of uh, documentation backing it up. Well, you know, you have to be careful because there are a lot of people who consider themselves researchers, and they come up with an aha, look what I discovered here. Oh, my God, this is earth-shaking. This is uh, terrifying. This is this, this is that. And, it, and they really have misread something. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the prime example is, and I hate to get into it, but is the income tax thing. Yeah. Some, somebody reads in the income tax code that something applies to the people of Puerto Rico and Guam and so forth, and they say, aha, uh, well, well, let me back up. The, the, the statute says, including the people of uh, Puerto Rico and Guam and so forth, and the researcher says, aha, this only applies to the people of Puerto Rico and Guam. No, 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 they're just making sure that you understand that it does apply to them as well as everybody else. And But the next thing you know, uh, it's got legs and it travels all over the place. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know, I know there's a lot of misinformation out there also. Yeah, so but, but, in, anyway, by well-meaning people. Um, but the Constitution, there's also a lot of... Uh, of uh, case law that, that states that we are not part of the Constitution. The people. It's between the government. It's for the government. Well, uh, obviously it is a... Uh, a lot of the Constitution is the rules and regulations by which government shall govern, you know, mm-hmm. but by which it will uh, enact laws and do this and that and so forth. Uh, incidentally, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the show, but today is Constitution Day. And not that you know from anything in the newspapers or anything that government has celebrated. Uh, President Bush in his radio address that I understood the... Uh, news broadcast correctly and did not misread, uh, said that he wanted to do something to inspire people to study the Constitution, but I don't know if that had anything to do with Constitution Day. And I, I hope he'll be the first one to start. Yeah, no kidding. All right, Eric, well, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much for calling, Mike. Good to hear from you. 
All right, uh, let's uh, look at the email. We have several things. Uh, Adrian out there in cyberspace says, I'd like to hear your reactions to the Urban Homesteading Act plans that the president announced Thursday night and what intended, unintended consequences you foresee resulting from this. As you know, the president gave a speech Thursday night in which he took responsibility for all the terrible things that happened with Katrina. Well, not all of them. Here's what uh, Adrian quotes from the speech. Quote, and to help lower-income citizens in the hurricane region build new and better lives, I also propose that Congress pass an Urban Homesteading Act. Under this approach, we will identify property in the region owned by the federal government and provide building sites to low-income citizens free of charge through a lottery. In return, they would pledge to build on a lot with either a mortgage or help from a charitable organization like Habitat for Humanity. Home ownership is one of the great strengths of any community, and it must be a central part of our vision for the revival of this region. End of quote. Well, let's look at that. First of all, you're talking about force. He's going to uh, provide this free of charge to low-income citizens. Well, the property was taken by force from individuals uh, who would have used it and would have built houses or office buildings or whatever, maybe used it for agriculture, who knows. And he's going to conduct a lottery to decide which low-income citizens can have access to it free of charge. But then they would be, once they enter into the scheme, they would be forced to pledge to build on the lot uh, with either a mortgage or help from Habitat for Humanity and so on. And then he says, home ownership is one of the great strengths of any community. And why does he decide what is the great strength of any community? Some communities don't need home ownership. My point is that all of this is more government. More government, more government, more government. Always the solution, more government. And uh, let's go right back to the phones and talk with Jeff in Colorado. Hey, Harry, how are you doing tonight? I'm just fine. Yourself? Oh, I'm doing great, doing great. Good, what's up? Well, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. Um, I'm sure you're aware there's numerous websites on the Internet, but um, there's an exciting website uh, on the Internet. It's... Um, basically covers several topics, and uh, one in particular that I wanted to discuss with you, and it's the, the website is www.freewebs.com, and then you put a forward slash after the com, and then type in G-O-V websites. So it's freewebs.com forward slash G-O-V websites. Now, this website is filled with government insider information about the inner workings of the U.S. government, packed with plenty of backroom Washington, D.C. ambience that shows the scary reality of the underbelly of politics. And this watchdog website on U.S. government corruption outlines the ever widening spiral of U.S. government corruption and cover-ups that needs to be told to the American people. And these are not conspiracies. I mean, if the American people found out the truth, the dangerous game going on in Washington, D.C., I mean, I think that they would tear it down brick by brick. I mean, this dangerous game, this website, uh, shows different secrets, cover-ups, and corruptions that are so explosive that it will shape Washington to its core, I think. Uh, and it covers several topics like Bush, politics, Area 51, uh, secret black government projects, 9-11, uh, Oklahoma City, nuclear weapons, the FBI, CIA, government agencies, the government attacking dissent. Um, in any event, uh, there's one in particular on there that I wanted to discuss with you, and that's um, a link, a website that's listed on there called fairtax.org. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Well, it's... It's basically got to do with abolishing the IRS and a consumption tax would be imposed. And I wanted to know what you thought about that because I think in the long run, if that happens, you know, for instance, John Kerry, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be wrong, but I think I'm right, I think John only paid 12% in taxes uh, last year. And, of course, this is due to a lot of the loopholes for the rich. And, of course, he has an advantage over a lot of the middle class and, and poor people as far as uh, taxes goes. Sure, he has the ability to uh, shelter a lot of income. Uh, well, I don't want John Kerry to pay 12% in income tax. I want him to pay 0%. And I want you to pay 0%. I want me to pay 0%. But I want it to come about not by replacing it with another tax, but by reducing government so much that we don't need an income tax and we don't need to replace it with anything. And that's basically my position on it, which uh, at some time we could go into in more detail, as we have certainly several times on this show. Um, but uh, uh, what, let's, let's go back to the title again. Was that three webs or free webs? No, it's free. F R E E W E B S. It's F R E E W E B S. Freewebs. dot com. Right. And then you put a forward slash uh -huh. after the com, and then type in G O V websites. G O V websites, all one word. Yeah, and it's no G O V dot websites. It's G O V websites, and that's it. So okay. you put in. So you put in basically www. dot freewebs. dot com, and then you put a forward slash. And then you type in GOV websites. Okay, good. I'll take a look at it, um, possibly not until the show's over, but I'll take a look at it and I'll... Um... And, 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 but you don't think that the consumption tax, by coming up with this, and of course, 
uh, the IRS, according to them, I think some of their estimates are saying that 25% of Americans don't pay taxes. And the consumption tax, what it would do is everybody would pay the same amount of tax on goods and services. And Yeah, but we see, we're not looking to make taxes fairer. We're making, looking to make taxes as non-existent as possible. And this is, to me, this is a whole diversion into, a, into another area. Uh, and if we finally accomplish this after great effort and many years of, of struggle, what would we have? We'd still have a $2.5 trillion government, except by then it would probably be $4 trillion, and uh, it would be taking about 30% in consumption tax. So you don't think that by abolishing the IRS, which would actually uh, abolish the corporate tax, which then would return lower the cost of goods and services, and the, that way, and of course, the consumption tax would get everybody on an equal basis, and that would the people that, it, that it's not getting now would bring in millions and millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue that maybe could save the what I think is the failing Social Security, uh, and also... Maybe no, no. If Social Security isn't going to be saved. If you, if you suddenly got a windfall from uh, heaven of $2 trillion, you know they would not spend it doing out Social Security. They would hold a meeting to do so, but they would wind up spending it on this plan, that plan, this program, this pork, that pork. They never, they never use money for what you think they're going to use it for. And uh, what we need to do is to take the revenue away from them, not change the way that they get it from us. And uh, I can't emphasize that enough that as long as the government is $2.5 trillion, we are going to see our education system destroyed, our health care system destroyed, our welfare system destroyed. And by welfare, I mean the system of private charities and so on. We're going to see our corporations destroyed so that they can't uh, uh, provide the goods and services that we need. We're going to see, see America destroyed because they have the money to do it, not because they're out to destroy America, but because they're politicians and they don't know what they're doing. So you don't think the consumption tax would bring in enough revenue to maybe – I mean, in a short future, to cover the cost of a national health care system? You don't think that that would do that? I don't want a national health care system, do you? Well, I, you know, I think that for uh, people that can't afford it, I mean, you know, that there should be some other source of... There was. There always was until the government got into the picture in the 1960s. Uh, I used to sell uh, private health insurance back in the 50s. Uh, uh, families would uh, sign up for $10 a month, and they'd be covered. Uh, their whole family would be covered, and they would... Um, uh, be covered even for pre-existing conditions in some cases. And uh, people were taken care of in those days. We had uh, uh, private um, charity hospitals, and we had uh, free walk-in clinics around town. Uh, Jeff, give us some thought. Let me know how you think in a couple of weeks. And before we go back to the phones, a question from Tuamas, of Mar uh, Tuamas Martinez of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He says, I've admired your work for some years now, and about a year ago I read for the first time your book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. There is a sentence toward the end of the book that, paraphrasing it, states, even though we most likely will never meet, I want you to know I'm on your side. And if it's on this page, I would like you to autograph my book. So I'd like to know if you will be touring anytime soon anywhere near Tulsa, Oklahoma. Do you have any venues to attend this year? I know you are under the weather for some time and hope all is better now. Uh, thank you, Tuamas. Uh, I will take this opportunity to uh, clear up a few points that maybe other people would like to know, too. Uh, it's more than under the weather. I have been stricken with a neurological disease that has so far rendered one leg of mine immobile. And I am uh, bound to a wheelchair and may be for the rest of my life, for all I know. I hope not, but if I am, I am, and I am prepared to accept that. Uh, the first of many uh, considerations is that I probably will not be doing any flying for some time. Uh, maybe I will six months from now, maybe a year from now, but for the moment, I have no plans to... Um, uh, fly any place. In fact, I'm even missing my high school's 55th uh, reunion, 55th uh, reunion uh, from uh, the days of Van Nuys High School uh, when I graduated back there in 1950. And I'm sorely, sorely missing that uh, because there are many, many friends there that are planning to attend that I would love to be able to see again. In any event, my life has changed considerably, but I have, my mind has not been affected. I can still write. I can still talk. I can still do the things that uh, I could do before, which were the main part of my making a living and, and my main part of political activities. And uh, tomorrow I am going to shoot a new television show for Free Market News Network. As you may be aware, I had a weekly Internet show for them, which began back in the spring and then was halted. Uh, at least new episodes were halted in June when this illness hit me. Uh, since then, they have been stringing together various material that I've done before and putting up a new sort of new show every week. It's what in the music world they call potpourri, taking existing material and stringing it together into something new. Tomorrow I will be taping a new episode here, and if all goes well and there's no slip between the tricks to the cup and the lip, uh, that show will be up on the Internet on Wednesday. That's at freemarketnews.com or fmnn.com, freemarketnewsnetwork.com. And right on the homepage of Free Market News you will see 
a, uh, a blurb and a link for This Week in Liberty, which is the name of the show. So my point is that while I will be able to continue all of my activities except one, the one is that I will not be making speeches around the country. However, uh, in uh, Atlanta, on, uh, in October, the third week of October, I guess it is, I will be speaking at uh, the Advocates for Self-Government 25th Anniversary uh, Banquet. Uh, well, actually, it's their uh, 25th Anniversary Seminar. It's uh, October 14th, 15th, and 16th, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I hope you'll consider attending. They had an all-star lineup, and I'm going to put that on uh, the video links page. Again, that will probably go up at the end of the show. And um, uh, if it does, uh, it will go up at the end of the show, and it will be up there probably 10 or 15 minutes after the show is over. All the information you need to, to uh, uh, find out about uh, going to there, what the price is, and all the arrangements and so on, and in addition to who's going to be speaking there. And there, as I said, there is an all-star lineup. There are going to be some heavy hitters there, and I think you are going to enjoy it if you can get there. And I'm going there because it's only about a four-hour drive from here, and uh, Pamela and I will just drive down there, and we're looking forward to it. All right. Enough of that, and let us now go to a happier note by talking to Tim in Oregon. Good evening, Tim. Good evening, Harry. Did I hear you correctly saying that you graduated from Van Nuys High School? Yes. Are you a native of Southern California? Yes, I am. Oh, I didn't know you were a native SoCal person. Um, anyway, getting on to the other subjects, uh, you were talking about you sold health insurance for $10 a month back in the 50s? Yes. Well, I, I'm guessing at the $10 a month it was some nominal figure like that. And, and the reason I remember it as being nominal is because we usually quoted the figure by the month rather than by the year as they do now. That was back in the days of the $5 house call by a doctor. Yes, right. Uh, uh, before, before you go on, I'm not much for metaphors, but I have to say that government in the health insurance business in the 1960s swept over and inundated private health insurance the way Hurricane Katrina inundated New Orleans and destroyed it. Yeah, it totally changed health care. Yes. Uh, on to your previous caller of the previous hour who was saying the things government had done well, and you mentioned the Panama Canal and the Manhattan Project. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the Panama Canal... The French had finished two-thirds of the canal when the Panama Company went bankrupt. Oh, that's right. You're right, yes. And the U.S. moved in there and took over what the Panama Company had been working on. Plus, it stole the land from Colombia. There was no country of Panama at the time. That land, the U.S. sent a gunboat down there and took the land from Colombia. So when you take other people's work and you take other people's land, yeah, you can be successful. <laughs> that's an old adage. Yeah, well, people don't realize that the U.S. took that land from Colombia. Anyway, and the Manhattan Project, the U.S. had been working on the Manhattan Project and didn't have a nuclear weapon until six weeks after Germany surrendered. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an awful coincidence in my book. And if people want to look up on the Internet, they can look up submarine U-238 and find out where the U.S. got most of its Manhattan Project technology. All right, uh, let's back up a little. Why, why are you saying that's an awful coincidence about just after the Germans surrendered that they didn't want to use it on the Germans? Oh, no, no, no. Um, if your car is gone from your driveway and you see somebody driving around town in a car that looks just like it, is that a coincidence? Or... Is there implied theft there? Okay, uh, hang on. Oh, I see. All right, we'll, we'll explore that in just a minute when we come back, so don't go away, Tim. Okay, Tim, I think I got it straight. You're suggesting that a lot of the technology was stolen from the Germans once the Germans had surrendered. Most all of it. Let me correct myself first, Harry. It was the U-234. I made an error. Uh, yes, that's where the U.S. got its enriched uranium, and it's also where it found the triggering devices for the atomic bomb. Okay, well, I haven't heard that before. I'd have to have to look into that. Look it up on the Internet. It's very interesting. The whole story um, discloses how it surrendered and how all the people from the Manhattan Project swarmed over the U-234 to get the uranium and the triggering devices. Uh -huh. Do you have a, a, a link uh, offhand? Just put in U-234 and Atomic, and you'll come up with dozens of websites. U-234 Atomic. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, okay, we're running out of time, and we have two callers on the line yet and some emails, so we're going to rush a little here. Joe in Maryland, how are you this evening? I'm doing just fine. How are you, Eric? Good. What's up? Well, um, I don't know what you heard or not, but um, Lush Rimbaugh, that uh, great... Republican lapdog, he yes. said that uh, Delay was just talking tongue-in-cheek when he was talking about the uh, great Republican budget fix that they put in since they've been in place. Um, I don't know if you heard that one or not, but I thought that was rather interesting. Yeah, no, I hadn't heard that at all. I mean, it is amazing how far he will take things to be a good partisan boy. Who, Rush Limo? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah they're always there to, to uh, defend them. This, he and, um, what's his name, Hannity, uh, Sean Hannity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Hannity. Yeah, uh, <laughs> O'Reilly, on the other hand, likes to pose more as an independent uh, as he promotes big government. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, Joe. Anything else? There's one other thing. I don't, one thing that has, everybody's kind of breezed over in, in Bush's speech in New Orleans. He uh, mentioned that he saw a, a bigger role for the military and government in disasters in the United States. 
Wonderful. out of the disaster itself. Of course. Hearing that really makes me feel good, um, considering they rushed into New Orleans. The first thing they did were disarm the citizens there that had firearms that protected their own property. Right. And it just... Yeah, yeah that, is, that is a disaster, and that's, that's contrary to the American way in every conceivable fashion. Yes. Joe, thanks so much for your call. And uh, let's go now to John in Massachusetts. John, are you with us? Yes, I am. How are you doing tonight? Uh, just fine, thanks. Okay. What's on your mind? Um, you made a good point earlier about the, the, that big government, well, small government actually isn't talked about in the media as much as it should be, or basically not at all. I think that's a good observation. It made me start thinking about it, and it's true that you never hear about that at all. Anywhere, any, 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 I mean, any channels, any mainstream media at all, you don't ever hear that. No, it's always two forms of government that are being debated. Uh, never, what's government doing this uh, in the first place? And uh, it's never, uh, uh, why would we rely on government? Never a discussion of government failures, uh, other than that not enough money was spent and that uh, the controls weren't tight enough and uh, they didn't crack down enough on big business or whatever it may be. So uh, that's all it is. It's a two-way discussion. And the third way, which is the way we would like to see raised and debated, uh, never gets brought into the discussion at all. No, no, most definitely. I, I totally agree with that observation. It's totally correct. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to mention, too, was the as far as the Manhattan Project went, Another thing about that was the uh, radiation exposure that a lot of soldiers um, were exposed to. Yes. You know, which is uh, which was one of the main things that came out of that when they were testing that. Right in New Mexico. Yes. Yes. I I, I um I also wanted to ask you too, Harry, if you ever have you ever heard of the Hot Project? Hot Project. Hot, the High Frequency Atmospheric Aurora Research Project in Alaska. No. It's it's a it's an experimental project that they started in '97, but it's an older. The technology goes back to Nikola Tesla, if you ever heard of Tesla. Sure. Yes. And it was, you know, a lot of things that he had uh, experimented with. But basically, it's, the last I knew that I heard it was a 180 antenna array that was set up that actually each antenna, they were all used, they could be used simultaneously together to focus, like, one beam of energy at, at, at a very high frequency. And this beam of energy uh, could be beamed up to the ionosphere to manipulate the ionosphere for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And one of them was weather control. And this isn't my opinion. This is a fact. There's a, um, a man by the name of Dr. Nick Beckich, who actually, who was from Alaska. His uh, father was a congressman who actually died on a mysterious reason. Uh, but the thing is, though, is that he's done a lot of work on this, and um, he's got a website, earthpulse.com. Okay. What's the name again? Uh, Dr. Nick Beckich and the website, earthpulse.com. Okay. We'll, we'll leave people to, to check it out for themselves because we're out of time. Thanks so much for your call. And we still have a few emails left here, and I'm going to try to, to race through them. Um, Yumi out there in cyberspace says, one simple question regarding the disaster resulting from the hurricane. How would you have handled the situation from preparation, evacuation, to rebuilding the city without the government, that is? Oh, boy, this reminds me of a, something Joe Sobern said, Joe Sobern, the excellent editorial writer. Um, when somebody said to him after 9-11, okay, you were right, our foreign policy was wrong, it's created all these problems, now what should we do? And Sobern said, hey, that's like me telling you over and over and over again you shouldn't smoke because you'll get lung cancer. And you get lung cancer, and you say, all right, you were right, I do have lung cancer, now what do I do? You silly goose, if there were a solution, if there were a cure for lung cancer, I wouldn't have warned you against it. And in the same way, I wouldn't have, put, uh, I wouldn't have been warning against the government getting involved in foreign adventures and causing 9-11. And in the same way, you can't have government involved in this creating a problem and then saying, how is the free market going to bail the government out? You've got to start from scratch and have a whole new beginning there. Tom says, what do you think about the Supreme Court nominee process now taking place? So even a slim possibility that any of the nominated judges will actually interpret the Constitution and not legislate from the bench. Absolutely not Tom, or he wouldn't have been nominated. And it isn't legislating from the bench that is the problem. It is the uh, sanctioning of laws that are passed that have no constitutional authority whatsoever. There's a misinterpretation here about what a conservative judge is. Uh, well, will he legislate from the bench, or will he let the legislature themselves be free to do whatever they want? No, we want judges to strike down laws that have no constitutional authority. And finally, Mark, in uh, I'm not sure where he is, somewhere out there, says New Orleans, the good parts, and there were many, will be back as long as the thinking government doesn't interfere. Well, that'll be the day. I've been there many times, mostly for business, and my daughter was attending Loyola. I couldn't stand to lose New Orleans. Get government out of flood protection, you know the rest. Well, I'm not sure which point is Mark, but thanks for writing. We will be back next week. And you know, I get tired of begging you about this, but I do wish you would do something good for yourself and your family this week. This is Harry Brown. Good night. <laughs>